I have never landed on my shoulder though. I've always put down an elbow to protect my head. And that's just led to breaking elbows. So I've never broken a collarbone and I've never smashed my head. I've been fortunate there. I, I guess. I don't know. I mean I mean what do you want to break? A collarbone or do you want to break a you wanna, <clears throat> you wanna break, break an elbow? You, yeah, you wanna well, you probably wanna break a collarbone and it, it depends on how bad you break your elbow. But I mean, I think that you were uh I mean, you're, you're, you're sailing over cars, sailing over a bunch of cagers in Miami. You're out training in the mountains of Colorado. Uh, that's right. But, uh, I mean, you know, you're fighting the cagers. I mean, you know, that's a, ba- that's a, that's a tough battle, but it's a, it's a courageous battle. Uh, there's a... I got, hit, I got hit once, too, also. The first time I got in a collision with a car was in Philadelphia. An old lady, old lady cut right in front of me turned right right in front of me and I slammed into her the side of her of her uh, of her car but didn't break any elbow then or anything and uh, I just felt terrible for her I think she was I think she was actually more injured uh, psychologically she it was shocked the, at the uh, violence I mean you were prepared for the violence you knew that cagers and uh, cyclists get 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 violent but uh Jesus Christ uh, I, I wasn't I wasn't though those those are my early days of cycling. You, uh, you were, you were a much more experienced cyclist, at least at that time. You were, you're the one that actually got me into cycling. Well, you're, you're the, the one, one that got me, and... you're the one that got me interested into getting hit by cagers. <laughs> well, yeah, I probably got hit by a couple before you got hit. You got hit very bad. Yeah, but you, you influenced you me, you, you influenced me so much. I said, look, there's no way I'm going to win this war unless I, I get, try, unless I, unless I let a cager hit me in the face. Let some Guatemalan illegal run you over. Well, and smash so your I was face thinking a, about it. I was thinking about how the French would hit me, and you know, the French would probably go to the side and stop. And then if the Spaniards try to hit me, they just charge me, but stop suddenly like a great matador. And if the Italians hit me, what they do is they just try to race around me just to scare me, but they'd never actually hit me. And I thought, well, if the the Mexicans wouldn't hit me, they'd just stop and give me a ride because they're great people. But the Guatemalans, we all know about the Guatemalans. What are they going to do? They're going to hit you right in the fucking face. And so yeah, I picked not the Guatemalans. They're not honorable. They're run, for, run you over and then drive away. For my, ba- for, for my the, battle with the cagers, the, the I, I chose the Guatemalans. Yeah. Well, related to the idea of the Guatemalans, uh, we should get back to it, which is the uh, the aborted, uh, the lost podcast. Got to redo it now about the... Uh, about this fella up in Toronto. Do you feel uh, Do you feel uh, really guilty about the abortion? I mean, a lot of people. About what? Well, you just talked about that you you know you aborted something great in your life. I mean, I'm I'm not really sure how I feel about abortion, but given that you went through with one, how how do you feel about it? Ah, uh, I didn't abort it. That uh, that was um, the program we're using. Decided the podcast needed to be censored. Oh, and, so uh, oh, it's like so it's three, like state sponsored abortion, like the Chinese. Oh, you had too many children. Well, you, you know now. Four you know now we have podcast. these. Uh, we we have these platforms, uh, uh, these technological platforms upon which you uh, you record stuff and you you promote stuff. And there's nothing wrong if, as long as you stay within the acceptable bounds. But if you uh, oh, you violated the terms of new. service. Yeah, you. Uh... Yeah, the terms of service are written by some special lawyer group, a uh, really high, high-powered l- group, and, and they're pages long, so no one ever really reads them or understands them. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's all this stuff going on right now with YouTube and um, people being, uh, what is it, uh, demonetized? Isn't that what they're saying that, that happens to them? If you say something that's considered to be hate speech? Yeah, well, if they, de- like if they demonetize the human side press, you know, I'm not going to be able to pay rent. <laughs> Because I depend, I depend <laughs> on the human side press for all that. This every every income. every every eight thousand six hundred dollar check I get per month from the human, children will starve. Yeah, children will starve. I can't I can't pay for all my houses. Yeah, there's a uh, there's a lot money. of weed dealers in Colorado and uh, in Las Vegas who are gonna not get paid. Uh, Look, it's gonna challenge the whole uh, the whole velocity of money across the system by shutting us down. But. Uh, but you know this guy. It's a challenge um, to surplus. And I, well, it is. But I've been I've been watching this fellow that you that from Toronto that you've been talking about this Jordan Peterson guy, and um, now is he the same guy yeah. as Mullahan? Uh no, I don't know anything about that guy. I, well, I know vaguely about that guy, and I know a little bit more now about Jordan Peterson. I've been watching a few videos. Right. I, I've I've listened to the <clears throat> uh, the Joe Rogan podcast with him. Did, did you I also uh, did tried you buy his book? No, I haven't. I bought. I bought. Uh, it. I know I, he's got a couple of books. I, well, he's got maps of meaning, 
and he's got right. uh, 12, 12 rules for life and antidote for chaos. I bought the uh, I bought the twelve rules uh, for life because uh, you know it's a uh, as you get older you really can't understand philosophy anymore and so this is more of a self help book and it tells you exactly what you should do to fix your life. Maps of Meaning, uh, on the other hand, was published in the early '90s and it's very very intense psychology. And by the time I actually understood it, I'd, I'd probably be dead because I hadn't lived my life correctly. So I decided to get the self-help book, which would allow me to read his deeper philosophy. But, but philosophy really always should have been about self-help. It, it was in, at the earliest times of the Greeks. Um, first, the first, I mean, philosophical the, the, schools first, were all about yeah. identifying what self-help was, was most fitting for the needs of a young man. Well, and he would go to that school, what, 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 whether it was the... Yeah. Um, Epicureans or the uh, Stoics, uh, and the, the, the families would send their young man out to the different schools, sort of like doing a tour, like of fraternities or something, because it was all it was all young men and, and their older teachers. So they they actually good deal. So you're, you're saying that the philosophers actually used to give that advice. That I mean, we almost didn't get that advice. I mean, I think some of the guys who we studied with. Uh, we're actually pretty cool and would talk to us one on one as 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 humans. Yeah, even Beiser, uh gave me a lot of good life advice. Uh, Spade did too. Yeah, but that didn't, that didn't come in the um, it, that came outside of the classroom, and that's the difference. Really, is that philosophy is now taught as a as a topic instead of right. being really self help, which was what it was always intended for. It was always about the either the education or the the, the way to live in life, how to live. Or it was like as Plato turned it into but, something broader, which was about the entire life of the city. Right, made it much more general and yeah, but in many ways. But I mean, just 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 backing away from Plato and getting back into like a classroom. Um, <clears throat> do you think that it was almost as if the classroom was a test for that person, and then give you life advice? Because I mean, they weren't basically going into a class. I mean, you, you were in classes with really popular professors. Mine were popular, but I mean, yours was really popular. So there'd be like a hundred people in a class, but he wasn't going to say, Hey, I want everybody to come with me now and I'll give them all life advice. Cause he wouldn't be able to give everybody individual advice. Similarly with my professors, I don't think. Yeah, but it was, I, I mean, I'm you, saying they, more, they, it was you more, almost, it was more in the presentation. You almost had to win them. My point is you almost had to win them over. I mean, you rose to the top of your class and all these guys we're talking to you individually, hanging out with you. Similarly with me, I mean, I was going to dinner with my professors and and uh, and it was only because of how I threw myself at the work. So, I mean, even though the classroom was anonymous, they were almost just choosing people. So they were almost doing that Epicurean thing that you were talking about where it, it, it was... Oh, there was... there. Look, there was there was definitely some of that, but I'm, I'm just saying that none of it was present... None of the philosophy, at least in the classroom or outside the classroom, was presented it, with with the idea that this was a self-help idea. That it, it was just presented as problems for guys to uh, secure tenure at universities. And it was something not to be taken totally seriously because the real serious stuff was... Buying stuff. What was the and, most? Uh, what was the most personal? The what was the most personal and good advice you got from any academic philosopher? Oh, the best. The best guy by far was Father George Lawless, uh, with at at uh, the Augustinian monk. He's now deceased. He died a couple of years back, unfortunately. But these guys all die. Who? Uh, um, yeah, but it's 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 unfair that Saint William Augustine. Burroughs lives older than anybody. <laughs> yeah, but her- heroin trumps. Uh, Trump's religion, I think. Uh, hero, heroin's the, the the key to longevity. You spend you spend forty years staring at your big toe. Yeah, well, I uh, used to ask you, you jokingly to 40 that I, I dreamt that William Burroughs died. I don't know why I was having dreams about William Burroughs. That's kind of kind of a problem. But uh, I never I never asked you about uh, Father Lawless dying simply because not not because I didn't think about Father Lawless. I mean, I, I probably think about the guy. If not every day, in, in some way, he's he's kind of like a great figure that you never forget. But the reason why I never asked about well, you came to you came to a class with him. You came to a class yeah. with him. I always no, remember. no, I'll never forget that. I mean, but and, um, I never thought that he, uh, he he was capable of dying though. But he was he was the only serious professor I had, where he read every year the Confessions in the original Latin, um, and he lived by the code of the Augustinians as he was an Augustinian monk. He only had a bowl of soup that was a single meal per day, and he lived in a very tiny, tiny uh, one room 
in uh, in Rome, and he was just a great scholar. He he was everything you would want out of that you should have had out of a, a serious philosophy professor, because philosophy professors at one time were monks. They were people who were were practicing in their own lives that with which they 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 were they were teaching, and that's been lost unfortunately in the discipline of philosophy, and. Um, so to run into a guy like Father Lawless, who was not only a scholar, but he was living out the, the texts that he was talking about and teaching, that, that's just the incredible stuff. And in many ways, I think that's why, getting back to this Jordan Peterson guy, he, he in many ways is living out these texts. And I think that's what's so in, uh, attractive to young people, that these ideas can be filled with, a, with life and with meaning. They're not just something that you're tested on in a, in a well, class well, to try and graduate a university. Yeah, to, in, in, to connect to that, did you, did you see there's this one uh, college lecture he, he gives where the guy introduces him um, and he says like 15 things this, this guy has done before academia. And uh, he, he worked as a, on an oil rig. Uh, he grew up, well, I mean, he grew up in basically cowboy territory, Saskatchewan, Canada, which is his, his uh, he's got a very folksy, farmsy accent. Uh, it's obvious to Canadians, it's probably less obvious to us, but he kind of like a Wisconsin, Minnesota accent, but, but even deeper and, and with some strange British mannerisms and phrases. But uh, he uh, basically grew up using his hands, building things, and uh, a couple of data points, he uh, built a uh, Inuit uh, perhaps not Inuit, but whatever the tribe is up there that's that's similar or perhaps slightly southern, uh, perhaps not an Arctic tribe, but he, he, he built half of his home in this style by hand. And uh, he's piloted all kinds of uh, 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 airplanes all around the world, and he's uh, sailed uh, boats all around the world. And uh, but the other thing is that he was a uh, he he was initiated into one of these uh, uh, Saskatchewan uh, native tribes as well. The guy's the guy's a total badass, and uh, I think he's probably learned a hell of a lot more from his rough moments working on oil rigs or as a cattle cattle ranch hand than than he has in academia. And uh, and it's funny because uh, the guy was pretty much up for a Harvard full professorship, and when Toronto brought him back to get to Canada, he he met up there. I mean, I I think he's far more comfortable in uh, in in Canada where he can get out. And, uh, and be in the wilderness very quickly. And he spends a lot of his time in the wilderness as uh, he's doing a, this uh, tour right now. He's doing about 100 cities. And he, it, first it started with 15 cities and then it, all these cities started selling out. But he's uh, mostly, when he can, he's driving around in an RV with his wife to these lectures. I mean, the guy does... I mean, would you say would, would, would you say that there's? It sounds like you're making this link between what he's what he's promoting and talking about, um, and the life he's lived. His seriousness about how to live is informed he, by the fact that he's actually gone out and had to live. Well, I mean, as opposed to being a career a career academic who is who's just gone through the academia and then and then become a professor he's, and he's he's never he, left he's, the system to do anything. He's done both, and and incredibly like J- Jim Scott. He became a very legitimate, very well published, very much entrenched in the uh, the, the status quo, and but but all the while knowing that he 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 knew exactly what the bloody hell he was doing, just like Jim Scott. They weren't doing it the kowtow to the powers. They realized that if you want to influence modern academia, you have to get into the best university. You have to go to the best school. You have to follow all the rules and pretend like you're just doing academic research. And that's what Scott did when he published his work on the Cambodian Hill people because it was brilliant. It was neutral. And then he did this, this, this jujitsu Aikido move where the whole, the whole uh, dominant power structure, he took it and he said, now you've accepted everything I've said. You've said I'm a badass. I'm going to turn it into this anarchist uh, not slant, but but evidence for for everything I've. So I've, what you what you're saying is, what you're saying is, if if I understand it, Jordan Jordan Peterson, like James C. Scott, went off into this very specific sociological study of these people, and it was completely acceptable to university. They were happy to fund he's, it, give him a he's in a grant full, or whatever. Full, per, full and professor, they didn't realize and, and, the and university. respected and cited and quoted. I mean, once once all your enemies quote you as being brilliant, 
in all their books, you've got your tentacles in the whole infrastructure. Right. And then he's and then he comes and then he comes out and says, Hey, wait, wait, wait. You motherfuckers don't really realize this is much bigger than just these hill people. I'm gonna start talking about all the rest of this now. The hill people and you're saying that Jordan the Peterson, hill people are Jordan brilliant Peterson has done something similar? The, the hill people are brilliant and productive and they run from the state because it impedes their productivity. It impedes their ability to carry on with the free life they want to live, which is their most productive life. Peterson, similarly, but I, I, but it, but it, keeping this in terms of Scott, comparing Scott to Peterson yeah. in this respect, and I'm going to make doing, a segue to Peterson doing something academic. I mean, Peterson is that what he did? Like, I guess he did clinical psychology for a long time. He probably cl- was very cl- clinical psych- very well regarded. Cl- clinical psychology with many. So he did his uh, dissertation on um, hormonal levels and, and and tendencies for alcoholism. And, uh, okay, so something very specific and very focused. That, that every and, and, and that everybody uh, would and beneficial. No one could disagree with the research, right, but, just like James C. Scott but, in many ways. What so so he focused on the data, but then what he then focused on was something after he had become you know vetted. Well, why are people alcoholics? What is the meaning of life such that you would use alcohol and affect these emo- these uh, hormonal or uh, metabolic states. Why? Why would you do this? And, and especially if it's not in your best interest. And then, of course, that that that's already getting a bit off the beaten path. Why would anyone not act in their best best interest? Why would they have nihilistic tendencies? And and Jesus Christ. Then he traces that back to. Well, these are these become philosophical questions, and that's that's how he gets into that. Just sort of like James C. Scott says. Why do the people want to evade the state and grow potatoes that are grown underground in the hills? And, why do they want to do who that? Who the hell? Why would they do who that? Who the hell would guess that this Saskatchewan hillbilly begins to say that his greatest influences are are Nietzsche? I mean, I mean, especially given this guy is a Protestant Christian, he is completely against postmodernism. He thinks that it's a complete waste of fucking time, and yet he says Nietzsche affected me in ways that absolutely tore me apart. He said reading Nietzsche was the one of the most painful things. And if you can get over it and you can survive it, you've you've been I mean his whole point is that you can't protect people from anything. It's only by great pain and suffering and, and, and trials and tribulations that people grow. And you know, by protecting your children or protecting society and whether it's the overprotective parents or the state. What what was the um what was the the specifics with Nietzsche that that were so um, well? Difficult ni- ni- for him? I mean, ni- was Nietzsche it makes ni- Nietzsche is very much part of the power structure, and the power structure, for better or for worse, gives semblance and meaning to the Western man. I mean, without an understanding of the narrative of the, of the power structure and the spiritual narrative of it, um, a Western man will fall apart. He'll just he'll either die of guilt or nihilism, and Nietzsche. Well, I know, I know, I know. Peterson is always talking about uh, order and chaos. That's that's what I've taken from a lot of what he's but talking ni- about. But ni- ni- Nietzsche and, is painful because and, Nietzsche digs up a lot of stuff about the West, which if you didn't quite have a, a good grounding, it would it would pull the rug out from under you. Now, you know, I think for most young guys, Nietzsche it, it really really gives a great power and and, and, and vigor to, to young guys, and it and it doesn't necessarily make their life more chaotic, but once you begin to understand how the West works in favor of the Western man, if he decides to pursue that route, you get a very bad conscience from reading Nietzsche. Uh, not necessarily, but you ca- you you could. And uh, now I, I've always what you mean you mean as as regards to all the all the stuff you've inherited that Nietzsche points out that you've inherited these ideas you've inherited you've morality inherited even just the way you speak and and, and it's hard it's hard to live a, a middle class existence with Nietzsche too with his constant reference to greatness and the overman and, 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 and how morality really um, it just, just, just enables a power structure. Now, what I, what I just said, I, I think Peterson would probably disagree with because he doesn't believe that um, the, 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 the layout of, of, of humanity has to do with a power structure. He, has to, he actually believes that it has to do with a, a, a very well understood distribution of what, what he calls IQ, which doesn't mean that uh, – one person's smarter than another. It's just it, IQ is correlated with success in, in, in Western endeavors. 
And uh, but what is what is what is Peterson finally interested in? Like being a successful Western man within the system that exists, or does he does he like Scott want to challenge the system itself? So he, I, I think Peterson is 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 very deterministic. Uh, not not with the question of free will, but with um, with with genetics, IQ, and geographical location, and and and, and I, I so he believes that the the correlation of people that are in colder climates and have higher deferral of gratification and the systems that they built, um, it benefits them and they all get along and they, and they understand and they're happy. So he certainly doesn't have a guilty Western conscience. He believes that those people when in the West, like in Norway, in Sweden, in Great Britain, um, they got to that place over a long period of time and they're very much coded to be successful. Then when they went over to the United States, they, they brought all that with them. Um, but I don't think that he's ever addressed like Scott, you know, the 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 conflict between the system itself. You mean like the? I he's, mean, he's, look, he's, Scott he's, is really, he's fine. Scott's he's fine with the system because he doesn't believe that it was some evil. I don't. Peterson doesn't believe that the Western system is some evil crafting system that um, is there to oppress others. You see that oppression and you see that inequality when the West mix with their cultures. And, and, and that is a tragedy that he recognizes, but he doesn't believe that um, cent- centralization or... or I, yeah. I, interpret, I interpret a lot of what he's talking about as the, an observation that things are uncomfortable, that there are dramatic changes happening as a result of um, globalization and technology, which is allowing people who were very, very different suddenly to be living alongside each other. Yeah. And then yeah. there are a bunch of political ramifications um, that that stem out from all of that, and it fits all of this fits into his broader thesis, which I think probably was developed with that maps of meaning, which is about order and chaos, and so it fits psychologically in a very very big and bold way what he was always been thinking about, and now we have these great conflicts of perhaps someone would say order, and the other side would say chaos, or those both could be flipped. I mean. It depends from which side you're looking at. But the, the, this and, this sudden emphasis on chaos is 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 coming from this chasm, which um, like when when Nietzsche said the death of God or or the or the lack of belief in the in the, in the system of the church, um, and it's and it's and it's a hegemony of, of order and interpretation. When, when Nietzsche was speaking about that, he you know he was basically almost predicting a dismal future for Europe because he said, what, what's going to hold it all together? Similarly with the, what, what Peterson calls a, a neo-Marxist attack on the nuclear family and on the, and on the European male, um, which is due to a project that, that Scott would understand as, a, uh, as, a, as, 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 as some attempt for, for dominance to create create a, a dominant well Nietzsche, Nietzsche would too it, it would be a, a, some sort of a will to power a new a, a, some new formation right and so he, he's basically saying that because this has been um, embedded in academia young people for for maybe 20 or 30 years have been not only um, withheld basic basic wisdom that used to help them, but they have been fed a line against the family and, the, and their own will to power, which has made them feel guilt and doubt their, 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 their very project. Now, there's a very interesting intersection, and it's, and it's still one that I, I struggle with, with even people like Molyneux and um, who you call Moulihan or Moulinyan, <laughs> um, to be more specific. <laughs> what, is, what does Moulinyan mean? Is it is it like a, is it like a, it's like an Italian insult, right? Uh, no, it's a, I think it's a very pejorative word for black people used by Italians. So probably it's going to oh, get mul- uh, this, oh, this oh, oh, mul- uh, oh, like like mul- mulatto, mulatto. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a pretty bad word in Italian. Uh, we're going to get demonetized and um, probably have to give up one of my houses. Well, Mulahan, whatever. But but uh, uh, but but, but yeah, in, 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 in any case, so so these guys. On the one hand, they call, uh, or at least Molyneux calls himself, you know, you an, an, an anarchist. But then at the same time, he he's very much um, a, a proponent of of the, of the Western European man. And Scott, you know, 
he he uses a, a lot a lot of very good logical um, argumentation, you know, very linear evidence based logical argumentation, which is very Western, to appeal to the reason of Westerners about why certain Western activity is very harmful to non Westerners. So again, it's like he's using logic and reason and playing the game to to un, one could say to un, undermine the West or at least to create a guilty Western conscience. And and so um, you know Nietzsche creates a, a, a guilty conscience. And so the interesting thing about Peterson is that um, he is not really trying to evoke a, a guilty conscience. He's almost trying to strengthen people who who are living in the Western system. Um, I find it very interesting because I think that the the wisdom he's giving is absolutely essential. Um, and I, 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 so you're saying you're saying uh, Scott's more of a revolutionary. Nietzsche is obviously more of a, of a revolutionary, uh, but Peterson is not proposing overturning anything. He's just talking about a way that you can live to navigate the system that will best best bring you some sort of personal fulfillment. I think that's how I understand what he's what he's what he's. Advocating, and, and, right? and I'd also say that he wouldn't ever characterize Nietzsche as a nihilist or a bitter man filled with resentment or whatever. Uh, I mean, N N Nietzsche um, understood the West, and I don't, I don't think he was trying to destroy the West in, in any way, shape, or form. I think a lot of people who are dislocated by Nietzsche's message would would just think that because you know God is dead and because there's no system that we must we must just attack everything around well, us. Well, I mean. I, I think that um, that Peterson's reading of Nietzsche is excellent because he, he, he he's beyond all the hyperbole and all the catchphrases and he's getting into uh, he's getting into the, the real the real heart of Nietzsche, which is not so much that God is dead, is that something even bigger than God has died and God is God is the biggest metaphor we have for all of that stuff that's not dead and that there's nothing to hold on yeah, to. Man, but, and that but really is I'll, his, I'll make it personal. I'll make it personal though. I'm sick of. I, I have a very I have a very Western job, and I am very much um, a contributor to, to, to structure and order of the, of the system. And I've never had an issue with that. I've been interested in finance, and now I do very high end accounting, very sophisticated shit that holds the system together. And uh, I definitely think the system takes me for granted because I for, for for what I do and the 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 dollars that are at stake, it's 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 big it's it's big shit. But um, I think that uh, Nietzsche, I mean, Nietzsche was uh, a, pr a product of the strength of the Western system. He was strong enough to, to make these, these very, very uh, prescient and powerful observations. But I think he was assuming that his readership could, could, could handle it. And um, that, that, that's... But I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the, the, question, the question is really, what, what is the objective or the aim, whether it comes from Scott or it comes from Nietzsche... Um, or it comes from Peterson. I think Peterson's objective is a lot more coherent than Nietzsche's as well as Scott's. And the reason I say that is because I think Peterson is really truly about helping people to feel better in a in a in a, in a situation that's overwhelming. To but them. After, he's, after, he's, he was, after he was after he was looking therapy. for truth, Nietzsche after, after yeah, but Nietzsche is the opposite of therapy. Nietzsche is like he's giving you therapy, but it's like a shock treatment. I mean, he's just. He's throwing Zarathustra at you. He's giving you the eternal recurrence. I mean, he's fucking you up with some serious, serious because shit. Because Nietzsche... And he's doing Nietzsche it in aphorisms. He's humanity. not explaining himself. No, Nietzsche cares about humanity such that he's willing to challenge them. He's not, he's not paternalizing. He's not hiding. He's not creating a hidden transcript. I think Nietzsche had a great faith in humanity to be able to say this stuff and say, look, I... He's leaving them with a potentially pessimistic observation. But it's a much harder. But it's a. It, but it's it's challenging and it's much harder. He's he's coming down. And he's saying, "Motherfucker, this is where you got to go if you really want to do it. Do you aspire to being great or not?" Jordan Peterson is not saying. Yeah, but that. but but James but, C. James C. Scott is 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 saying that yes, there is greatness, but it's hidden and there are transcripts that are hidden about it or or whatever. But James C. Scott is actually a revolutionary. James C. Scott tomorrow would would be a part of an anarchist, Marxist, whatever it is, rebellion. And I mean, he he just supports so like fucking shit I, up. I, so he's a fuck shit with, up guy. With, with Scott, I'm 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 gonna say that, 
and I, and I don't and and I have another research, but I, I'm I'm going to say that Scott has got to be against any 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 large system which uses legibility to control, and so therefore, while Scott might be a uh, communitarian in, in 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 small in small societies, he, uh, that that is that he might support a communitarian in slash localized socialism in small communities. I, I wouldn't for a second think that he believes in global Marxism because he clear no way no no yeah, way. So so when when you were talking about yeah um, the, the 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 dichotomy between uh, Scott's anarchism and his Marxism, what what I what I what I what I what I what I read from that is that he he believes in a very very localized utopias as he saw. Oh, I, I agree. As he saw I in Cam- I think Cambodia, he, I but think he, he would... certainly didn't mean that there should be a state-based system of, leg- of legibility no. which enforces some type of a, a central plan. And I don't mean to say for a second that you, you intended that, but that, that that's the only— Well, he needs to write that book, though, but he needs to clarify that. I mean, he writes these big big thesis, big-type books like Seeing Like a State and, um, and, and, and Three Cheers or whatever that is. How many cheers for anarchism? Or whatever. I don't Three know Three cheers many. for anarchism. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there were, there were, there were fewer but, than 100, and, and I think it's more like, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's probably like less than a dozen. It's, it's less than what Peterson— But he needs to come out. But the, the point, though, he's, he needs to come out and say that I am not for full-scale worldwide Marxism and the workers' rebellion and the proletariat and all that— I am actually for protecting these tiny, beautiful communities and their hidden transcripts. Um, and I, I, but I wonder though, like you and I have discussed it before, is that his whole project was about unearthing these transcripts and bringing them to legibility, which is, which is defeating the whole thing he was, he's about protecting, it would seem. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the... There's a contradiction there. There's a contradiction there, which I'm not sure. I'm not sure you can say that Jordan Peterson has a contradiction. I think you could say Nietzsche has a contradiction. I mean, Nietzsche was a was a weak, sickly man who wrote all about the overman. I mean, he wrote about all the things he couldn't be. I mean, it was it, he's a beautiful artist, but in terms of a man and what he's done, I think you'd have to say that, you know, if we're to, if we're to look at Scott, if we're to look at Peterson and look at Nietzsche. Peterson has been the, by far the most successful at, at at his project, being that his project was really about self improvement. And I'm, you know, looking at these YouTube videos, the responses this guy is getting. I mean, perhaps people don't really understand all the philosophy and all that. They buy the books, they don't really understand it. There's something of a of a phenomena going on, obviously, uh, apparently, but that people are still being exposed, even if they pick up a, just a tiny bit of the. The clear knowledge this guy has from both a, uh, a a therapeutic with patient standpoint as well as a philosophical one, as well as the the life experience that you were talking about, the guy's head. That's a huge wealth of knowledge. That guy, that guy's, that guy is really, really, really doing a great service by by speaking, by by putting out videos and books. Yeah, I mean, so 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 Nietzsche was uh, stymied by his health. Peterson was not. Peterson had two really healthy and, and bright kids and did incredible things um, physically. He proved himself in work many times over, whether it was manual work, whether it was academic work. He sailed, he flew, he hiked, he shot, he hunted. So he wasn't sick. And so Peterson was realizing that he was the last guy on earth, on the fucking planet, who had successfully lived as a man proven himself physically had successful Jesus children Christ. successful children who are now in their mid to late 20s i've actually uh look, looked them up a little bit well that's you know you're bringing up you're bringing up a great point though peterson really hasn't emerged until he's fucking lived the life of a man established himself in so many ways and then after his children are grown he, i mean the guy you know, I, I know he goes around to all these colleges saying, you haven't really lived. Get your room in order and it, before you could come here and shout me down and throw things at me and protest me. But in many ways, that's the way this guy has lived his own life. He's not only got his room in order, he's, he's lived a full fucking life as a man, as a, as a, as a man and a, and a patriarch of a family, as a father and all of these things before he's come out and said, now I'm ready to speak about things. 
Nietzsche never lived that life before he spoke about anything. He couldn't even get laid. Nietzsche couldn't get laid. Peterson not only got laid, but he had two two kids. And he still, um, it was funny. Uh, I had a, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, a couple weeks ago, and it was a Western woman. And she said, I was talking about Peterson and she said, um, and I mentioned the kids and he's like, well, what about his wife? And I thought, you know, he hasn't uh, ever mentioned his wife, you know, and I don't know if he's still married. <clears throat> and then I realized, hey, where's the wedding ring? He's got a wedding ring. Yeah, on. He's got a wedding ring on and, 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 he, and he's actually traveling around in his RV on his, on his tours with her. So obviously, you know, the guy has his shit together. He's kept his marriage together for all that time. He's had two kids um, that he's raised very well. And he, and he speaks very much about. But wasn't that his whole point? Isn't that Peterson's whole point, though? You better get your fucking shit together if you want to go around Look, how, yelling how around the world be a about how everyone else should live. How are you going to be a philosopher if you can't raise children? If you don't, if you, you say, oh, well, I'm too chaotic. I'm too, <clears throat> I can't stay with a woman, all this stuff. Well, how do you understand the idea of procreation and, and raising a family and society and getting your shit together if you can't successfully raise children. That's a big, it's a well, big fucking look, test. There's, there's, <clears throat> well, yeah, it's a test. It's a test. You can't, you certainly can't speak about raising children <laughs> if you haven't done it. But I mean, a guy, a guy like Nietzsche, for example, never really, he, he, he never talked about children and all. Well, maybe a little bit like the next generation will come, but it was very abstract. Everything was very abstract. Uh, the guy like Peterson, I mean, I would actually like to hear Peterson talk about raising children. He's probably got a, a, a number of n- a great books still in no, him. No, no, he, he, he's, he's, about he's, the family, he's talked extens- right? he's, he's talked extensively about it. Oh, he has. Yeah. Um, uh, so he, uh, as, as a few data points, he talks, uh, about in, in, in his latest book, he talks about children and one of his, his key rules for life is, is raise your children in a way that you will not hate them. And he said that we're all monsters, your children are monsters. You are a monster, and we almost t- we must tame this. And, and 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 he said, if you raise your children in such a way that you hate them, that everyone in society will hate them, and they will they will become totally castigated and uh, and isolated, and, and and they'll never learn anything, and they they haven't learned the value of cooperation, and hard work, and all that stuff. I mean, all all of these things are 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 essential. Obviously, we learned them. I think you a little bit more than better than I did, but both of us, and, and let's just tie, I mean, there's no Alaska podcast. We will always refer back to Alaska. Alaska was, was such a, um, iconic moment. It's a kind of, it's an iconic moment in the history of the world, but, um, think about it. You showed up and obviously your arrival in Alaska was, was far more impressive than mine. I, I was basically given a shoe in. I had like a rich daddy basically, but uh, you, you arrived on a dock in Alaska and through your cooperation and your conscientiousness, and you had to do all kinds of shitty jobs that I never had to do. You had to work on the fucking slime line, man. And you had that crazy season and you had to ease yourself into forklifting and, and training. But imagine yeah. the guys well, you had well, to get along with. You had to get along with hard scrabble main uh, lobster fishermen. And, and, and those guys are cool to get along with, but not not easy. I mean, Gil, for example, didn't give the time of day to most people. I mean, you really had to look. You gotta have you gotta have um, with with anything in that kind of environment. You gotta have a skill that people will appreciate. And I was I was fortunate that I was a really a master forklift driver, and it stood out immediately. And uh, and and that, that and, something- and that forklift skill, though. I mean, Peterson would go nuts if he heard your story. Let's talk about what you needed to do to get, or, or let me tell you what I think you needed to do to get your forklifting skills. You had accepted a certain period of your life, a great sacrifice. You'd gone from a high finance man to contemplation of various business interests in, 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 in uh, the entertainment field in, in Miami to taking a stoic view that you, you would be uh, accepting a minimum wage. And you chose a very, very difficult uh, night shift job where there was very highly technical uh, ma- manual labor using machinery, which a lot of people would think is easy, but as we know, you can be very sloppy and be very dangerous. 
and you persevered for for many many years, and then you wrote a philosophical well, literary uh, tome I didn't do it for many on, years. on on this. Well, well, what what would have been an eternity for most most mortal educated men such as yourself? No, but and but, then you no, transformed it, this it skill. Did. I mean, you, no no matter that it was a minimum wage job, you said I'm going to be the best at anything I do. Damn it, and and then you arrived to Alaska with a with a basket of skills. Um, um, you know, you, you no. It, by Alaska standards, by Alaska standards and the cannery standards, I only had one skill. Yeah, which just so happened to be, which be... just so happened to be, quote, the best damn forklift driver I have ever seen was Morlene. That was the plant manager who had been there since the late 80s. He had seen everything. The motherfucker said that you were the best forklift driver he'd ever seen. So let's 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 say that. Basically, this guy is saying in recent Alaskan history. You're the best forklift driver ever. Jesus Christ, that's a fucking... Well, there's, I would hang up my spikes Well, there's a that, lot man. of great ones. There's a lot of great forklift drivers that came through there. Uh, I know that. I'm sure of it. Yeah. No, uh, no, no, really no, no, no doubt. You've got to be badass. Look, Carl... Car- you got to be badass to forklift during San I, I remember season. Carl... It's, it's, the, it's Car- Carl's it's been around for a while, and he said he saw this one guy... He said he saw this one guy driving a forklift at, at that... That tiny little uh, crack crack house uh, uh, cannery that was not down the road in Seward, but absolutely around the coast, closer to the prison on the other side, where you, you've probably never been there, but it's where a lot of ships do dry dock to get repair. But he said he saw some silky smooth forklift driver, and I said to him, "Man, have you ever have you ever seen the uh, the guys drive the forklifts on in Seward?" And he's like, "No, I I really don't. I'm I'm inside the wheelhouse." But man, he never he never saw you drive. But I'm telling you. They they speak whimsically about the forklift drivers. The fact that you were singled out by a guy who's been around for thirty years is the best forklift driver. Well, that meant a lot. That meant a lot to me. What Charles said to me about that, because uh, Charles Charles knows what a good worker is. Charles also said great things about you and and, and uh, loved your work he, ethic, he, and uh, th- also loved the fact that you love to pitch fish, which is what he would rather be doing than being the well. I'll, I'll tell you, you're like that Scottish missionary who was in that uh, movie Chariot of Fire. He was this like guy. He ran in the foothills of Scotland and fucking Great Britain or whoever he ran for chose him to run the hundred meters in the Olympics. And then when it came time to go to the finals, it was run on a Sunday. So he, he didn't run in the, in, in the finals, but, uh, I mean, you're basically this guy who comes from this yeah, out of the, out of the middle and out of, I mean, just, just, just out of the blue and where you got your forklift skills, no one knew. I mean, they wouldn't have thought. I mean, everybody's got a story. I mean, they're probably coming from nah. they're probably coming from I mean, Washington State or Oregon or maybe California. No, yeah. What 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 I've what I've remarked upon what I've remarked upon at least with the forklift though is there was a lot I had to learn like techniques. They all these techniques that were inherited over all this long period of of that cannery in operation, and. Um, I suppose I suppose in many ways it's like it's like techniques like you learn in life, right? Um, you, you you technically need to pick up certain things, and uh, whether it's forklifting, uh, and someone just says, "Hey, man, look, this is how you do it." You need you need that guy to say, "This is how you do it." And I was not I was not someone who knew how to do all those techniques before I got there. I'd never seen people do that kind of shit with a forklift, and so it was very important to me that people. Someone would tell me, like, Gil would say, hey, hey, do that. Stack those totes. I'm like, how do I do that? I don't know how to do that. I mean, I might be great at a forklift, but I, I don't know how to do that. You know? Um, and, I mean, isn't this, like, uh, this, is, this is the whole idea of philosophy, though, which is that there are techniques that you need to master, that you need to learn, <laughs> and you need a teacher who is willing to t- take the time to show you how these, how technically to, to navigate these things. And... I, and I don't understand why um, – I, I understand why a guy like Nietzsche is, is, less, is more acceptable, at least philosophically. So you were taught you were I understand taught why how to James C. Scott is acceptable in, in philosophically. I, I was, I but was I, taught. But I, I was taught. But I do understand I, – but I do understand why Jordan Peterson is causing such turmoil and problems. And it is because he is giving people a technical, uh, idea, uh, technical ideas about how to live. And that – and that is the shocking thing. That stands, and, and a lot of these ideas stand in front of the way of globalism and all of us, we're all going to be but, the same. But ask yourself, at, 
and have a quality. Yeah, yeah. But you know, a lot of these, ask yourself why. I mean, a lot why, of these big yeah, ideas. Yeah, why? Why is Peterson deeply affected these people? I think the reason why he's deeply affected these people is because he's not just giving advice, which any, I mean. Especially millennials, they're very cynical about this self-help shit. They're like, well, well, you know, who's trying to program me? He's basically saying, one of his advice is don't do anything unless it gives meaning to your life. Because if it doesn't give meaning to your life, you're going to go very, very quickly to a place of hell. If you're not, if you don't have a project that gives you meaning and what you're doing is not contributing to your meaning. I mean, this is very much Morlean Free 2008. Think about it. Think about where you began philosophically, very pragmatically. I would. I don't want to say you would t- look. I, I wrote one great thing. I wrote one really great thing that got that I that I should probably reread. It was it was called Prolegomena to um, ah, what the hell was it? Um, well, it's it's, 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 on, it's about, on the internet. You can read. It's sort you, of like you a manifesto. You can read it. Yeah, it's there. But it was a, it it was kind of like an a, a, a fragment of a manifesto about. The only serious questions are the ones that involve how am I going to live going forward? The rest of these questions, these philosophical concerns where you get debate people or whatever, it has no bearing now, on your now, life. A, a, a and lot these are, of that these are contests. That is both, these are intellectual contests. <clears throat> they're not yeah. they are not they are not something that determines how you feel on a day to day basis and how you, you you have meaning and understand meaning. But, which isn't that Jordan Peterson's well, point? Here, here, you here's need to get here's away the thing. From all this I'm, I'm going to call bullshit on both you and Jordan Peterson. You both, you guys, because not 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 necessarily bullshit, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say that you, what you guys are saying is true, but there's a certain amount of background to it. Um, you're gonna pursue a lot of stuff that is not good for your life. There's gonna be a lot of people that are are gonna say the, the put you put you in the wrong direction. I mean, maybe you you have to read Derrida and realize that he's he's just not that original or he's not useful. But there's going to be a lot of poetry. There's going to be a lot of music. There's going to be a lot of things that that are not necessarily practical. And then there's going to be a lot of contradictory messages. But you have to work your way through all of that and then pursue something that is going to actually be practical. But I think before you get your to your practical stage, you've, you're going to go in a lot of wrong directions. And you're going to be exposed to a lot of non-practical stuff. So... You, 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 you might actually not only just have to read something which isn't practical, but you might have to live life poorly. You might have to live it. I mean, for, for and, example, and, and, I mean, I was, I mean, I, know I felt the calling of Morlean Free after reading it and I quit my job. But it was only, it was, no, <laughs> seriously. I mean, it was only after that, that it was, it was you know, you, you had written me specific messages, you know, why are you going to serve this billionaire? And it really ate at me, and, and so and so no, it, it it motivated me. But then, but then, you know, I I, I didn't necessarily want to go back into corporate America. Uh, I I had some things that knocked me back in Alaska. Alaska is eventually where I, I wanted to be, and I wish I could have continued. And if there was more money involved, I probably could have done it. But when I went back to corporate America, I had no issue with it because of the way that I had overcome corporate America, left it, and then when I came back to it, it meant nothing to me. And I was a much stronger corporate America person when I when I came back. But I think I think you you um, you, you typify almost almost like being able to like work the, at Home uh, Depot and not have it affect you. But that's right. But there's this attitude of like the uh, the Native Americans who will will be hunters on their own for their for their own food and sustenance and their families and things. But then they'll go out uh, and be hunting guides and make money, and they'll use that money to buy some supplies they need, fix the snow machine, whatever they do. Uh, but these jobs, these will be, these jobs will incorporate a little bit of their interests, but for the most part, involving them with people they don't care at all for. Uh, but they do them just the same, and they still have dignity. That's the that's the main essential element. They still have dignity beyond it all. And they're still a native person that has, comes from a certain place, a locale, and it's not. They don't feel like they're prostitutes or they're they're giving something away. That's that's really the essential thing that dignity is maintained. And I think a lot of people do jobs, but they don't have any any allegiance to something other to, for which they would have some idea of well, dignity. Well, the, the idea of dignity and, is basically the the whole antidote to chaos idea is that. 
if you have what well, is you can it's, you can you, come you from can somewhere. work. I mean, I mean, think about how um, uh, when I was uh, emptying a uh, a uh, sludge pit in Alaska um, with two other guys, all three of us. I think it was Chris, me, and uh, Martin. No, no, not Martin. Uh, who, who? Esteban. And you know, we 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 were we were we were shoveling five pound buckets of basically shit. Not human shit, but basically fish effluvium, and I was enjoying it. Not not only did it not violate my dignity, and not only did Gil not think that it violated our dignity, he thought we were you know good sports and having a good time. And uh, it was it was it was it was a challenge. So I think what, when you are when you are powerful spiritually, really nothing can violate your dignity, and you're almost considering everything as just a great but, challenge. But, but you know you know the people the people you were working with. All had personal dignity that was respected. Jesus among everybody. Christ! I mean, I mean, um, Danny and Stephen. I mean, Esteban. Esteban was a tomato farmer. A very he owned farms down in Mexico, yeah. and he was a tomato farmer. Uh, Chris was a great artist, and uh, and studying architecture, and just a badass worker from Maine. Uh, these these you 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 with your background in accounting and running and all these things. I mean. These were these were very very accomplished people that were all doing a very menial task that you probably could have you could have said I could assign anybody to that, but nobody insulted you and said that anybody could do this job. No, it was you guys doing this job who were very dignified people, and it was a pleasure to work among people like that. That's the difference, you know. When you're around people who who view you as a someone who could be exchanged with any other person, that you're mm-hmm. not really someone. Who's who's worthy of some special respect that acknowledges where you come from and your your location and, 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 your, by, and by all of your ideas like that, and everything. And by doing things like that for for Gil, for example, I mean, God, the the level of responsibility that he suddenly entrusted me with, giving me the keys to the truck, allowing to sign out the truck, uh, those, uh, you know, those. Uh, but this barrels is, but of this shit. I mean, I, I, I would deliver. Of, I would what? deliver stuff to the uh, to the dump. I mean, just like learning how to back in that fucking trailer to the dump, you know, all that stuff. That's. But is isn't this? But isn't this kind of Jordan Peterson's point that you got all these people who say I am an important person and you need to give me respect, but they haven't proven it in any substantial way within the world. And I mean, when you're around people who have proven themselves through acts, real physical acts in the world. You have a very different idea of Well, them. what's that phrase? You what's say, that phrase? God you... damn it. That's a man who can do yeah, things. No, well, well, and that's very yeah. different than some little, little 20-year-old who's a shit talker with a sign who wants to you know, have a protest. Well, you know, it, it's the thing. The guys who do well on the front dock are when they first start. I mean, and you said this to me. You said, you don't know shit about shit. You don't know shit about shit. But then you eventually do and you learn very quickly. It's very painfully. I mean, you know, you learn – the ins and outs of how a forklift can can break and when you need to bring it into the shop. Yeah, your hands don't work. Your hands don't work from pitching. Your hands fish don't work from pitching fish. There's, 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 there's a lot of tricks you learn on on how, on how to survive. But when you eventually learn shit about shit, you've gone. You've your your sacrifice was was you know your 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 humility, and then you gained pride through the respect of others. And look, all all you need to know is all you need to know is every Mexican there was uh, from the crew was ready to go for war for you, uh, kill people in a bar, whatever. And the only reason they were willing to do that is because you were a badass worker and you'd earned the respect. But general, you're doing the same thing at the accounting place. But the thing is, though, I'm not sure the accounting people they have that same level of respect. There's something about manual labor which which separates the 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 wheat from the chaff, you know. It really does. Like, in knowledge workers are viewed as sort of interchangeable. Even if you're like a badass. Maybe you got one guy that recognizes like, oh, motherfucker, he can really do it. Um, but what are they really going to fight for you? Are, is the guy going to go into war in a bar for you? Is he going to beat people with bottles and kill people? No, you know, I mean, and, and, and this is really uh, what we're talking about. And, 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 and who, uh, other than just being deranged and wiry, which was my, my state in Alaska... Um, I certainly hadn't been practicing fighting. I certainly hadn't been practicing uh, ducking and slipping and all the combos, which is kind of like what I do every day. I woke up at 5.30 this morning. I did a speed workout on the Chattahoochee River, and then I boxed for 15 minutes, and I just fucking killed it early in the morning. 
But uh, but when I was in Alaska, I wasn't doing that. But I was pitching lots of fish, using my hands, and just being in in general deprived of uh, polite society. So when polite society would bump into me and challenge me when I'm out with a b- bunch of Mexicans, I, I, t- I tended to get feisty. And I yeah, I, I, I tried polite, to start to I tried to stu- start society. two fights, but I but but in both 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 cases. <laughs> When the white guys from Seward, who were probably very wealthy because they were, you know, in their early twenties, they had inherited a lot of money. When they saw a bunch of when the, they uh, saw a bunch of angry Mexicans, the, uh, oil spill wealth, yeah, oil spill wealth. When they saw a bunch of angry Mexicans just staring holes in them each time, they uh, they they suddenly they suddenly back down. So I, you know, maybe I would have gotten absolutely destroyed in a fight. But I'll, I'll tell you though that. My my anger and my my courage. I didn't even. I, mean, I wouldn't even use courage. I just was. I would not not fearless. I I just I I probably wanted something bad to happen, but um, after yeah, but, after but, but after the, throwing real- two hundred pound halibut, I was I was ready to kill somebody, and and these guys these guys who yeah. were competing like one time when when this one guy was competing with this Austrian girl that I was trying to bang. I, I eventually did. You probably know about it because you were trying to get to sleep when I was doing it. But uh, I mean, like that. That was a smelly girl. Yeah, the well, smelly girl. It could. I, I probably smelled very badly because I hadn't showered. Nah, uh, she stunk. She? I told her. I told her during the night while she was fucking you. Your pussy stinks. <laughs> she was two feet away from me. I'm like, oh, bitch, your pussy. Yeah, stinks. and then later on, she's like, she. And later on, I remember the like next ass. night she came to me and she's like, my pussy does not stink. She said she was like. I said, nah, nah, your pussy stinks. I said, nah, nah, your pussy really stinks. You can't tell me otherwise. I know your pussy stinks. But uh, <laughs> God, so so general. Those are the conversations you could have back in Alaska. Well, you still can have them there. Uh, the place society of the lower forty-eight. You can't really talk like that. Um, but 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 the most important point though is that people are willing to go to war for people who have proven themselves in a physical sense. And uh, getting back to Jordan Peterson, what you're saying, like he's like some physical guy who's done all these physical things. I believe there really is a relationship between good philosophical work that is actually therapeutic and actually living in the world where you have danger of death or dismemberment. Wittgenstein had it. Wittgenstein was in the trenches of World War I. And that trench, that trench warfare experience with the bullets flying past his, his eyebrows led him to the best parts of the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus about the mystical, right, right. about the religious life. It's, that I mean, all of the is, best philosophical yeah, work yeah, yeah. has been the result of people who but, have gotten insight l- from actually being in the world. Yeah, in, but let me. I mean, when let I say me, being in the throw, world, I mean me actually doing wrench, physical work. Let me in throw the world. a wrench in this explanation because this is this is what this is what I can't quite understand. Um. I think the the boundaries of philosophy are, are sanity, and I think that Wittgenstein is a very good example of that. I think if you dig really deeply into what Wittgenstein's asking, you can unravel um, using logic or questioning logic um, the very way your brain operates. And so the success of philosophers sometimes depends on the way that they push themselves. Yeah, but the way the brain – I may just interrupt you right there. Like the way the brain operates in logic – like these two things are not what gives meaning to people's lives. Logic won't and giving brain brain function synapse shit is not going to do it either. And you can give all these things as evidence of something, physiological evidence, but it will only actually mean something in a poetic way, meaning that it's like a it's just more words. Like you feel like there's some yeah, I have a brain I think. I've never seen it, but it's still poetry. And really the best response to like what life is and how it's lived is something that's poetic and religious. And I guess like Jordan Peterson is talking about that when he talks oh, about you, archetypes that, that's, that's and a lot of, a lot of that kind of thing. Core. Which is true. No, man, the you, most you got it. That's stories. the absolute core. I mean, he basically is saying no matter how you feel about Christianity, you said that story of Christianity, understand it deeply and be affected by it. No matter what you believe in terms of the, the modern industry of religion— you need to understand Christian Christianity deeply because it has affected your last six hundred years of of society. Well, Nietzsche said, "I mean, Nietzsche, Nietzsche said the same. I mean, he basically said that well, God may be dead, the Christian God may be dead, but 
God has taken other forms. God is the God of science. God is the God of drugs. God is, the, I mean, you could, there's all these new gods. We're continually looking for a new God. And there's that great, uh, I'm not sure you've really read him, but John Gray, who's an English philosopher, who's really extended a lot of this Nietzschean kind of stuff. Man, you sent me some books. stuff on him. I'm surprised I never read it. Yeah. Maybe maybe but I was maybe I was studying the whole the idea CPA when you sent me that. Well, I mean, I mean, you you're aware of some of it. I mean, even Beiser, Frederick Beiser, when I went to that class that uh, he had with you, I think he was talking about uh, like Marx had, had just taken um, Christianity and turned it on its head, and 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 things like that. That people were still using the the this Christian idea just in new forms. And that's what John Gray is essentially saying in a lot of his work. Um, and I think Jordan Peterson is as well. And he's saying essentially what John Gray is saying, which is that you think you've gotten so far past with your atheism and your rejections of all of the old traditions, but you're just reformulating the old traditions in new forms. And in fact, you're doing a poor job of it, a piss poor job of it, which is actually hurting people rather than helping people because it's serving various interests which are not in your best interest. I think that's 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 kind of the Jordan Peterson thing, is it not? Yeah, no, I mean, what what you just said was 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 pretty 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 incredible. Uh, yeah, and uh, but the but the question is though, there's this you know the, the feeling that you know there's there's a Western there's a Western con- controlling system which is somehow um, destroying the individuality of Western men, but. The, I think Peterson's observation is, you know, maybe it's not necessarily the, the Western mechanism itself. It's the way it's been turned against men and turned against the family to then very, you know, annihilate or disintegrate the, the Western project itself. You know, perhaps the modern complaint of the West is not the West itself, but living in the hell of a Marxist destruction, attempt at the destruction of the West and all of its contradictions. In other words... Well, there seems to, there seems to be for me. There's this whole for what what I view as what's playing out. And, and um, what I just said, by these, the way, is probably, is probably I, the most intelligent thing I've said in two years. And I, I hope it sounds intelligent uh, when I listen to it later, if it's not lost. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sure it's going to sound great. Let's not gonna, let's it's not right let's not right go now. over two hours. No, we won't. We're we're far from it. But um, the, and I smoked a Joe though, Rogan that, cigarette, uh, so I know I know that I'm what I'm oh, saying man. It must be good. Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan in the house. That 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 meathead, that tattooed meathead announcer dude. I love Joe Rogan. Um, but you, you, I, one of the you know Peterson's been on Joe Rogan three it. times for like three hours. Well, I've heard him. I've heard two of them. I've heard now, two of them. That's the, how I, mean, I know I mean, a lot do you, about Do you Peterson. see Joe Rogan interview Peterson and Peterson shows up in a suit and, and, and Rogan says, wow, you you really dress up fancy. And, and Peterson says, well, you know, I, I, I pack light when I'm on the road. And, and, and Rogan spits back, no, no, no. I, I meant to say, you look very good. I mean, Rogan is this very polite gentleman. I mean, he interviews very sophisticated philosophers. Rogan's great. Rogan's but great. Why would Rogan, an MMA Rogan, um, guy pick Peterson and Molino? He's at Molino twice. Well, because he's a he's not an MMA guy. He's a he's a he's a finely ID you know fine ideas about jujitsu. I mean, all this why stuff. isn't this podcast on Joe guys, Rogan? I mean, Joe Rogan is the me- jujitsu is philosophy. Joe, Joe Rogan is jiu-jitsu Joe Rogan is, is Nietzsche. Taken to Joe the Rogan is like a very healthy Nietzsche. Yes, but if but if 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 Nietzsche had only known a little bit about jujitsu, he would have shut the fuck up a little bit and and gone and trained with the. Do you think Gracies Nietzsche could have done a spinning, and, um, uh, 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 a spinning back kick to the head like Joe Rogan? No, no, Nietzsche was too sick. Nietzsche Nietzsche would pull guard. He, his whole thing would be to pull guard, <laughs> not not get stand up, get him on the ground, and then like look for leg locks and stuff. Nietzsche would be very limited. But he, he, would, he probably would have been very wait, good. Wait, wait. He, I, I mean, took he, notes. Wait, I took notes last podcast, and I've, I've actually got my notes next to me. I'll read them later um, just so we can get an idea of what we, <laughs> what we lost. But uh, So what was this? But, Nietzsche. But, but, Nietzsche but listen, wait, though, wait, I, wanna, I need to write this. N-I, N-I-E-T-S-C. 
H no wait T S C oh shit yeah whatever Nietzsche, it is. Nietzsche, just, so just is spell it like it sounds would spell go like it sounds. for the leg lock no I do leg locks he so he pull guard no you pull guard he would go grab you and pull guard that means like you pull the guy on top okay. of you. And then go for go for jujitsu leg we, lock leg we, lock. We shit. lost that's we lost do. some podcasts, but but he, here are here are some notes I have. I don't know if you if you have any notes. There's 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 five notes. Do not smoke the vinyl. The social tropes are still the game. We have created no alternatives. Are you ready to get popped? Restrict the supply of Hampson admirers. That was that was <laughs> those were the top talking points. <laughs> I have no idea what those mean. <laughs> I have no idea. That's a lost podcast. That's a lost that, fucking that's podcast. That's unfortunately man. lost. That, that uh, although I I do know I do know that there was quite a bit of discussion in that podcast about technology and crowd formations. I remember talking about that about Elias Canetti and about how we live in a time where. You can have like all these admirers and followers, and they can be in, in within just just minutes. Yeah, they can be brought together yep. to destroy people or to create <clears throat> havoc, and you know to, to comment on something and overwhelm systems and and to overwhelm people yeah. and you, to bring you, your people argument to then was that places where, like where Jordan Peterson is yeah, speaking. The the the, the, inter- the internet his, is crowd. His speech yeah, is crowd, and 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 Peterson is is talking about this crowd as. A series of positive and, and very negative destructive forces, but are consistent with the the animal kingdom. His first chapter is on uh, lobsters, which are older than dinosaurs. They're three hundred fifty million years old, and they have characteristics that that talk about basically just g- genetic movement of of, of of animal species. And and there's a, a a series of hierarchy based on competition and of, of dominance. And, and sharing and cooperation and fighting in the lobster community and, and the pheromones, but it's it's basically mimicked in the human hierarchy and and, and the way human beings uh, compete and interact. Um, so I mean, I look, I I love I love all this stuff. I love all this stuff, but I hope he's emphasizing that these are these are metaphors from observation of other species on the world, and this is poetry more than it is. Um, something substantial. Poetry is, you, you've got to have a poetic, and, 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 and Wittgenstein understood this perhaps more than any other philosopher, which is, and, well, Heidegger understood it too, which, which is that language has poetic roots, poesis, the, the Greek, and it's all about this making of, 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 of some truth which, which, is, which is not substantially going to last, but it's something that, that is always going to be interpreted and reinterpreted. And I mean that's the beauty of poetry well, the, that you that you're the, trying to you're trying to understand that you've pushed language the, you've given a new metaphor poetry. so you're pushing the understanding of the world in, in a new indeed, way but but you haven't you haven't come to some truth the idea is that you never get to well, truth the, 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 you the, never the get the poetry there. of western of, of western science if 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 you want to seduce the westerners if you want to seduce them in the form of their own poetry you have to speak their language and so this is obviously why Peterson lures these Western readers in with these scientific metaphors about data, repeatable experiments. I mean, he- look, I just watched I just watched the video where he was talking about the left brain and the right sure. brain and all this stuff. And but and that's only one. That's he, only that's only one language know he knows he means. has to speak because he knows he is trying to bring people. But I want to wanna, I wanna to hear him say. I, I, but I do want to hear him say. But I do really want to hear him say that. Me talking about the left and the bright, the the right brain, is no more consequential for your life as I am reading this poem by William Butler well, Yeats. I mean, I, I would, I would, I would say that, that if if you're talking to Peterson, he'd say drop Yeats and pick up Dostoevsky, because if you talk, if you listen to him talk about the two most influential people, or th- I'm sorry, the three most influential people in his life during the time he wrote the book are Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Fyodor Dostoevsky. And Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, if you're talking about a man who's talking about left and right brain and lobsters, obviously he realizes he needs to write a tone poem to yeah, get the attention. I agree. Because he realizes that if he wants to start with Solzhenitsyn, 
he's going to be, in, 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 you know, bringing himself into the crew right. of the, the got, comparative literature he, people. He I, wants. I'm to, being hard. I'm I, perhaps. I, look, I'm no doubt being too hard on him because he's got like how many hundreds and hundreds of hours of of YouTube videos and books, and I have I've looked at a tiny fraction of all of it. Um, and maybe I think probably you're right. He's presenting all of these different pathways back, whether they're through brain science and, and neurology, or they're through poetry, or they're through Dostoevsky and, and Russian literature, or through German philosophy, or whatever it is. He's trying to bring all of these things read your together, blog, man, in a way that gets I, to some central read, ideas, read. which. Which I don't disagree read, with. I don't disagree with the central Fuegan, ideas. Man, I, I was affected by this Fuegan blog. I'm telling you, and and one of the things that was written on the Fuegan blog, perhaps then discussed a little bit more at length at Morley and Free, was that the Argentinians would ask you about the your your life and your background, and well. Actually, you might have spoken about this in Argentina, but actually this was when you were in another country. It wasn't Peru. It was another country, but it was called the La Poeta Negro or something like that. What was the... Oh, the Black Poet of Ibarra yeah. And Ecuador. you said... The Black so, Poet. And, and so what you said in this poem... and, and uh, The Black Poet. What you, the Black Poet, I hope yeah, he's still yeah, alive. What, what you said, uh, you, said you said the West was uh, a culture of, of science and government. And I think that this is obvious to Peterson, who as an undergraduate studied politics and then as a graduate studied uh, psychology and then became absolutely brilliant in, in fields of, of anthropology and, and, and philosophy. I mean, I, I think standalone philosopher, I think, I think, I think uh, Peterson is, is probably original uh, in, 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 in the style of uh, – of a, a Kierkegaard or a Nietzsche. I mean, in, in the analytic world, I don't think that they would say he contributed very much, but in terms of uh, adapting your life into your own philosophy and using your life as a philosophy, he's, he's up there with, with the greats who have used their lives. Like, like Kierkegaard, I would say, is a perfect example. And he, and he speaks about Kierkegaard at, at, at length. But uh, what the... F I, would bet, I would bet that Kierkegaard is probably the closest guy to him. Yeah. Now, now mentality. I found I found page two to the notes. These aren't numbered, so this must have been before I started numbering them. But it was agriculture was the original platform. It allowed for the city. Okay. Uh, and then yeah. second second is this is a time of great crowd formations. Sebastian Junger. Agriculture always forms crowds. Vienna was no utopia. So, uh, yeah. if I had to pick from that, I think yeah. I think Vienna was no utopia because we're what does that mean? We're talking about the intellectual circles and the cafes. Perhaps we're talking about the uh, the fact that Wittgenstein came from Vienna. Uh, Oh well, Victor Schein, We we know that Victor Schein hated hated Vienna. That whole Neo yo and gave away all his money to his sister, who he said um, the the money won't. She's she's already super rich. It won't compromise her any further. It's the best person to give all this money to. <laughs> oh man, Victor but this Stein. is Victor Schein's the baddest motherfucker that ever lived, and he gets no respect. All these analytic guys are are, 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 are are trying to create philosophy out of his books when his books were never intended to be philosophy. That's the thing. And and I, you know what? I think Jordan Peterson's running into that same problem. He's trying to talk about how to live in life, and people are trying to turn his ideas into ph philosophical ideas and political ideas. And of course, they turn them into something that they're not. I think he spends half his time saying, that's not what the fuck I meant. Yeah. Which is what Wittgenstein was doing all the time. That's not what I mean. That's not Peter, what I mean. Peter, Peterson and he is really all, got all these fucking. He's really fights. perfected this. He's doing it. Uh, he's doing this shit on video, which makes him vulnerable because he looks like a ghost most of the time because he's not sleeping and he's traveling a lot and he just puts on some suit and shirt and but he's looking into the camera and he's answering like uh, twenty questions that came. Uh, I was listening to his questions today, and uh, you know he, he's a conservative guy. He's a, he's a, he 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 
Is that the uh, is that the April twenty eighteen? Yeah, questions? and I, I think I think it was. Yeah, I was looking, but, I was looking but, at that but, too. But they they get, you know one one of the questions that they they tossed him was something that that almost you you would have thought that he would have uh, filtered because it sounded like a uh, one of those talk show questions. But it, it basically said, "Oh, we're a gay couple and we want to raise a child," and he spoke fundamentally about the difficulty of raising any child and about the male and female influences which must positively affect the child. And he said, "You must morally think about if you are going to raise a family." How are you going to overcome the fact that, you know, in single mother families or in or or, or with the lack of the play of a father and, and, he, and he backs it out to, to, to rats. He says that when rats get play from a father that is teaching them how to play within the bounds of acceptability and to tease within the bounds of acceptability and to push boundaries, but not too far. He said, if you upset that dynamic, you will you will upset humanity and, and he left it at that he didn't say that in the sense that the government would take control of an economy and then would 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 say that these people are are should be killed the nazis are the great the great example of it um and then totalitarianism which is control of minds and control of of of, of these of, of of the way people think under the penalty of death both systems have the penalty of death the Jews, to their credit, have kept alive the idea that Nazism and fascism and it, in that form is something to be guarded against. But no one, I believe, other than Peterson, really, is doing the protection of people from the totalitarian left. Because the fascists are really more or less kind of right-wingers. Um, Irreligious right wingers, both both sides are irreligious, but but the interesting thing is though is that the 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 Marxist totalitarian people have no one who's speaking out against them other than Peterson. The Jews speak out against the Nazis, so we all hear their voices loud, and we've heard it for for sixty years, but we haven't heard for sixty years someone speaking out against the crimes of Stalin, right. yep. who killed who killed and, and, a lot and, more and, people. And, 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 and Mao and Mao is a big one too. Yeah, all of I mean the killing on that side was even worse than the than 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 Hitler. And and that is historically not is it's not spoken about. Yeah, I mean H but, Hitler but being for the book no one was, speaking was, out was, against was, uh, was, was 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 nasty. And so, you know, maybe But you get people but you get people today who dis, who don't really even understand the difference between a fascist and a totalitarian. Right. Uh, a Nazi and a and, Stalinist. And, and, gives, and, and Peterson like, gives a really good example of um, even like the, the the current right, where um, the the line in the sand is like um, if you were to support like uh, David Duke or like the Ku Klux Klan, that everybody would 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 think that that that's bad. Um, or you know um, you know the, the libertarians you know obviously would never accept like people that are racist or saying that you know you should exclude people they would basically say no it's all all based on talent you can't you can't choose race so there's a clear line in the sand like you know with libertarians and, and the right of where where you've gone too far and if you've gone too far you're in the fringe but to your point in the left um they they support you know like you know if you listen to bob marley um you know like i shot the sheriff you know you could say oh well, that's just a power structure thing but it's like you know they 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 basically advocate you know, uh, straight out assassinations, and the uh, the uh, the the people that were actually attacking relatively normal conservatives that were trying to speak at Berkeley. There was a a, a philosophy professor in San Francisco. He was actually a, a philosopher of ethics, and he wore a mask and he carried a, a U bar bike lock, and he was hitting people on the head with it. Oh, that guy, yeah. And 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 so yeah. so they they and, and and they would say that that well, that's kind of okay because. The people that he was protesting against, you know, Trump and the guys who supported Trump, were so bad that you, you know, you should you should try to hurt them. But but you know these these are the same these are the same justifications that appeared during the Spanish Civil War, that appeared during uh, the Stalin period, that left left far left wing intellectuals in Europe uh, were ignorant and wanted to willfully ignore. The, 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 the gulags and the killings that were going on in totalitarian Russia at the time. 
Among them, your 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 boy your boy Sart, your boy Sart was uh, a a big apologist and, and a denier. I mean, he, but he was just one of many, one of many, and it's still continuing so, to this day. And I think Peterson, Peterson, to his credit, is someone who's standing up and saying, "Look, you might be against fascism, which I am against too. You are against Nazis, which I'm against too. But the way you're going about it is going to lead to at least as much killing." as the side that you're against. And that is the great point. These people are just, they, there's just no one out that's that's making this point. So this is, I mean, he needs to- This is where he, 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 this he is has the, a lot of uh, this this evidence-based stuff that these guys, it's, it's, it's a very Western conversation. Obviously it, it has, it, it goes it goes far outside of the, the meaning of the, the, the poetry and the philosophy that is the foundation of his, his whole thinking. But he's basically saying to these people, if you believe in equality of opportunity, who who doesn't? That's great. If we all want people to do the best, we must have the same opportunity. And so you wouldn't want to say, oh, because a person's black, we're not going to bring them to the table because that's obviously not true. I mean, there's all kinds of genius in the world, no matter where you come from in the world. But he said, you, equality of outcome is where all this killing begins. You can skip to fascism or, or communism or whatever, but he said... If you but, try to force well, equality why don't, why of outcome, people, that is where is you're going to get argument. nastiness, and that's where all the death. Exactly. That's where all the death occurs because the state is the mechanism, and the state obviously breeds insanity. And to to, to make equality of outcome, the state is going to legislate it, and it will result in killing fields. Why can't these people understand that? It's a pretty simple argument. Why can't these twenty year old kids well, understand if, that? Equality start, of opportunity. It's a if good you start with Marx, man. I mean, Marx is very Marx really. Uh, Wrote a, wrote a great novel. I mean, if you think about all the people that are buying Fifty Shades of Grey and watching the movie, it's like the best-selling novel ever. I mean, Marx is basically the Fifty Shades of Grey. It's, he's addicted people, and they can't they can't get over it. He he had a, he he wrote a great novel, and everybody believes it. But it they they ignore the evidence. I mean, he's the he's you know Marx talked about how religion was the uh, was the um, what was it the narcotic of the masses? What did he say? The, the, opi- the, opiate, the opiate of the masses, the but of the masses. Marx has been the opiate of the uh, the modern day uh, thinkers. Well, at least I mean, and also according to John Gray, Marx ripped everything off. That of, that was uh, what what I just said about Marx was was I mean, was better the, than the other thing that I said that was that I thought was really great, but I can't remember what that was. Well, sometimes these things are lost, uh, but I, but the thing is though is that who. Who is defending the people, the regular people from totalitarianism? There haven't been defenders. No one speaks up. And I think Jordan Peterson has taken up that mantle. And the, the, the strange thing is, is that I think all the people that are social justice warriors, if they could only realize that the, the thing they're fighting for may actually kill more people than the thing they're fighting, they think they're fighting against, that would be the great realization. And it just it, it just is a lack of an understanding of history, and a lot of it is a is is a suppression of history. Because I think in the Western world we still have a lot of apologists for Stalin. We still have a lot of apologists for Marxism. We still have a lot of apologists for communism. Well, I mean, this is this is the key thing believe. is that that Peterson really is not an apologist. I mean, he's trying to expose no. He's saying it, it will kill you. Apology. He's saying it will. I've I've wa- I've heard him on Joe Rogan. He says this is the killing fields. This is where these ideas lead. The killing fields. These little stupid ideas. This is where they lead. And when I heard that, I thought it was a little over the top. But at the same time, I don't I don't know. I mean, I'm as I told you, I've been reading a lot of the Gulag um, literature, particularly this 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 Varlam Shalomov who wrote the Kolima Tales. He was in prison for thirty years in in terrible Siberia, uh, in labor camps. Yes, these things all begin with a small idea that takes hold among intelligent people. That's the problem with it. Intelligent people with a small idea, and then they can justify horrific acts. But, but the thing is, though, is that the people who are fighting against the, the so-called Nazis, they want to call Peterson a Nazi or whatever, they don't realize that they are, are building building a foundation for something that is at least as bad as Nazism. And in terms of body counts, 
does it outdoes it by a, a, a perhaps tenfold. Yeah, well, the, the the thing is, is that when you when you've got a great scheme, and it involves human capital, there I mean, there's going to be a lot of a lot, lot a lot of deaths and a lot of people that are working. I mean, the, these guys talk about you know the the oppression of the proletariat, but they need the proletariat to do all their dirty work. And there was, Jesus Christ, it was something like the Ukraine was very, very productive in terms of feeding its people and they could trade a lot of their uh, food and grain away. But when the communists came to power and they, 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 they set up all their systems, I mean, it just absolutely decimated the competitive forces that allowed the Ukraine to feed the rest of the world. And the uh, Molyneux gave a lecture on the, the truth of Thanksgiving and, uh, it's a real it's a real downer if you if you want to celebrate Thanksgiving because they the uh, <laughs> they they say that oh well the um, the uh, a bunch of dumb uh, dumb Europeans kind of wandered across the ocean landed in America you know didn't know how to farm and um, were starving and the Native Americans gave them all this food and taught them how to farm and then they once the Native Americans taught them how to farm then they had a, a bounty and then they had Thanksgiving. Well, the the actual diaries of the people that were there, in other words, this, the stuff the literate people wrote down to account for what happened was more like, well, we got there and we were the most sophisticated agricultural um, community in the world at that time. So we all arrived with uh, extensive farming knowledge and we arrived on uh, rich black soil. And our, and, our, and, our, and our goal was to, to raise crops. The reason why it failed is because we had this socialist vision, this utopia that we would collectivize everything. And it disincentivized everybody. And after a year, it resulted in, in near starvation. In other words, this force was so powerful that it overcame the human tendency to, to feed itself. But obviously there was a breaking point because there's a self-preservational mechanism and you know, the human ability to just like Call, call bullshit. And so the governor of this new state said, well, you can, you can keep what you get and you know, do what you want with it. And then obviously agricultural flourished. And they had, like three years later, they were ready to export to the new world. I mean, it had so much grain, so much everything. And so the, you know, either you could say this is an evil capitalist tale, or it's a, it's a, idea that no whatever the course of force if you get in the way of people's destinies and individualities you're going to cause great suffering or death whether it's famine or actual murder and uh i mean if you taught the story of thanksgiving to children now and you say look because we tried to tell people what to do they nearly starved i mean how, how would that affect young minds if you if you tell if you try to tell people what to do, you might cause death. Well, I mean, what, what, what would that that that's a pretty look, profound these are, method, these are, right? These are these are Western message. stories. Yeah, it's profound. It definitely is profound. But these are these are a bunch of of Western stories. I mean, you you could have as opposed to what as opposed to what the, um, as opposed to what. Some Inuit hunters hunting a whale. But to, once you brought, you know, once you brought those guys into a to Western hunt the whale. narrative, once you've, once you've told your story through the prism and lens of the West, you've written it down and taken photographs. I mean, what are, what are you actually communicating? I mean, it's just... The, I mean, the, 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 the Inuit obviously are, are, are a message that something beyond discourse There's, exists. I, I think, though... Uh, no, I think there. I think there are, and there and don't and don't make it sound like I mean like I, I read Carpenter and I I, I see those photos. No, I, I know. I feel. I, I feel. I feel I, hope. I, I mean. I mean. But I think though. I'm. I think there's experience outside. I I think there very legitimately is experience outside of our own worldview, and I think the Western worldview is. It does have its boundaries. Now that that, that experience and, can 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 make and, people like you and I very happy, but. Does it? What's what's the contradiction for when we're trying to live in the West? I mean, do we need to kind of like bracket it, or does it make us feel guilty? Does it slow us down? I have I have no idea. I I think you I think you just end up being a miserable person, and um, you you know that there's something else out there, but you can never really be a part of it. 
You know, I, I would but get this I, but, feeling but, sometimes. But, but I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I don't buy, I don't buy fishing in the lake. Right? I, I buy, I buy that it gives. No, it's not misery. It's not misery. You get a glimpse. You get a glimpse of something other, and that's the best you can do. And um, like, I'd be fishing out on the lake, right? And uh, in Wisconsin, and I would have this sense that my my great grandfather had been there, and my my grandfather and my father and and all of the people of the lake, but then also the natives perhaps were fishing in the same way, S- same ice, same everything. And there's, there's spirits and gods and there's wind and there's all this shit going on, man. And uh, I can't deny that this is happening. And it's there, it's there if you just sit there and listen to it. If you sit there long enough, you could hear it. And and w- what does that mean? Does that mean that I, 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 yeah, I, I, I figure go back something out. I, I get a job I, no, man, somewhere. I, I figure something um, out. Uh, Peterson would say, "You and I have, have have covered all the bases." And his book, if you know, I've only read three chapters of it. If you read the book, I think we both read the whole book. It's it's great advice, um, but I, I think we already picked up on most of that when we were much much younger. Um, I think we were. Yeah, but you're not you're not a tr- you're not a troubled young man, and no, I'm not a troubled young man. Isn't that who these books we are were, for? We were troubled young we men? were from a very young age. I mean, we were publishing periodicals. I mean, that's not normal. Um, I I think we we no. I mean, it's not normal at all. It's not normal to write poetry about ice cold Coca Cola while you're working in a tennis center. Um, uh, I mean, we were doing <laughs> phenomenology out of necessity before we had been acclimated to even who the phenomenologists were. So I'm not sure that, 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 that Peterson is probably writing a book for us, but it, it's interesting. Yeah. But this, this gets back to, this gets back to another important point though, which was, I was what I was saying on the lost podcast, as well as this one, which is that technology has transformed all of it. And that these young people are being overwhelmed with a lot of shit and they just, and they can't escape it, and because they're they're connected to all these technological platforms, the overload is just so extreme, and the crowd formations make it seem that everyone feels this way, and they need to go along with it. And I think it leads to these outbursts. And I think, at least with you and I, we may have felt very comfortable in our ideas, but we certainly were going to give a lot more thought to making some great outburst. Because we didn't feel that we had like a thousand people behind us or we couldn't go on Facebook and create some sort of outrage and feel support. We really felt like you had to sit down and think about these things. Technology is allowed for the fact that you don't have to think about any shit anymore. Just go for it. You know, write a little line and you get thousands of people supporting well, you and likes. Yeah, and I mean, you feel the, empowered the, to the, just the go sad, crazy. The sad thing is that that's what Peterson's yeah, fighting, I think. He's fighting a bunch a, a of lot morons. Of these, a lot of these guys they, think that no if per- they if they if they dress if they dress the role that 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 that's it. Like uh, I ran into the uh, you know I, I told you in the, in the Mexican podcast uh, or about if I, if I if I talked about my my trip to Mexico that I I, I ran into a twenty two year old and a twenty nine year old and they they looked like hipsters. Now they these guys had traveled thousands and thousands of miles um, in North America and South America um, with very little gear, um, just uh, re- really living off the land. And they, their trucker hats or their, their clothing was frankly what they were able to cobble together and maintain. And uh, they, they, they had an image that I think it w- is probably projected in the social media that if you just look like these guys... You've almost done what these guys have done, but here are these young guys, really, just living in in primitive conditions and uh, cycling on bicycles that are not mountain bikes, all for the most rugged terrain. Not even complaining, not even realizing how tough their cycling is. Like I, an experienced bike tourist, you know saw these kids like all they did was attack the, the hardest terrain on these cyclocross bikes. And, and, and it, it was absolutely brutal. I mean, I, I knew the sand they were going through and they were smiling ear to ear 
um, almost far more advanced than than anything we, we had done based on you know given the short year and a half that they, these these kids have been cycling. But the thing is, is that the and this is scary. There are guys who think that if they read their blog, if they kind of put themselves in in what they see perceive to be the shoes of these of these kids who are actually doing this stuff, maybe dress a little bit like them and mimic their uh, mannerisms, perhaps that they see in Instagram or whatever, that they're there. That's the hipster mentality, and which is scary, is that they they well, they, they is, believe is, deeply so, in the simulacra. So, but but the problem is that these guys who are legit are not loud voices. The loudest voices are people who are simulacra and approximations of these people who are marketing it. The loud voices are 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 charlatans, are hucksters, and at least in this case of Jordan Peterson, a loud voice. He's become a loud voice, and he's a legit loud voice for a, a certain position, because the people who are loud voices against him, who are they? You know, I I, I would love to believe that like Black Lives Matter is is a very important movement. I really do believe that 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 black people are being killed. They're being killed in Chicago. Those cops are racist. I believe in all of that. But Black Lives Matter has yet to have a loud, outspoken voice that is legitimate. There is no legitimate leader. Not to say that there needs to be a Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X, but at least give me an H. Rap Brown. Give me a Stokely Carmichael. Give give me give me one of these guys, these motherfuckers. Or give um, or give me a guy been, give me a guy that, which, that that actually wants to get the root of the problem and, and not talk about a state solution. I mean for sure, not a Cornell West, and not a not a uh, what's his face up in Harlem preacher. You know, it's fu- it's funny that, yeah, that a, a white Canadian Molino has probably done more to understand. I mean, he talks about the state and how it controls education and pushes people into welfare and breaks up the nuclear family, pays. But you, but you got to have people who are more than just yeah. theorists and 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 guys who jump on a bandwagon and get a get a technological um, crowd behind them. You got to have guys who really have fucking legit experience. I mean, you know that's the whole thing with Joe Rogan. Why Joe Rogan is 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 the guy he is because that motherfucker will take you on the ground. He's a black belt in jujitsu. He'll fuck you up. Guess how long it takes to become a black belt in jujitsu. It's like ten years or yeah, something like yeah. that. I mean, I've uh, uh, I, I, Jordan I, I, Peterson. I, I, boxing, how many years? How many years has Jordan Peterson put in? I've 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 can, try. Right, but you got to put you got to put your time in. You got to put your 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 fucking time in. And Jordan Peterson's put his time in. He's made a family. He's done all these things. He's been a professor. He knows young people. I mean, just shut the fuck up and listen to the guy. Don't talk him down and, and throw slogans and signs around. That's just bullshit. Just listen to the motherfucker, and if you think you got an idea that can, you know, you know, you know, disagree with something, you you need to bring it in the proper forum because he's bringing it in the proper forum. This is the this is the university. This is what the university is supposed yeah, to be about. And I, and I think Jordan Peterson is is is, is secretly a, a probably a brawler. I mean, I mean, he's definitely been in some fights. I mean, I I, I think that uh, I remember Bernard Baruch, this guy who was a, a traitor and then a statesman, who said. I could get in the room with any Kaiser and like realize that no matter how the negotiation went, I could beat the guy's ass because he was golden gloves. I mean, I think that's how, how Rogan feels is that he realizes, and this is the same thing. I- yeah. But people are, people are better at people. People were more badass back in the day. Brooke was badass in New York. I used to go to Brooke college. You know, I went to a few things over there, a few events. Uh, I mean, these, these guys were guys who made money, but they, they, they got dirty. And that's the thing we don't have now is we have people that live in a virtual world of virtual crowds. They don't, and they don't, like they that. don't know and what they, dirty, they think dirty getting is, dirty. Yeah. Well, they think getting dirty, it doesn't involve bleeding. It just involves like blocking people and like defeating them on some internet battle. I mean, that shit is yeah. nothing. That shit is nothing. These people have never really, I mean, I'm not saying you got to get into bar yeah, fights man, or something. No, no, that, that's, that's at point least, number two. At in, least, in at least podcast, if you're going to say some shit. This podcast is lost. That's point number two. It, yeah, but you can't. Internet it, shit. You know, the whole idea gets down to, yeah, we're old. But you know what? We're old people. So we sound old when we say, don't say something to somebody over the internet that you wouldn't say to their fucking face, right? And, 
and don't be and don't be and don't you know i i just saw some jordan peterson podcast where some guy like shouted him down or something from the upper upper level right i mean just just come and, and talk to him to his face as man to man you turn this into this big uh this big uh you know, well, scandalous Peter peterson uh, comes, comes out with his gets backpack recorded. in the middle of the square and people come pushing him around but i mean uh Look, it's to his credit. He's it's to his credit that he's he wants to fight these fights, and um, I think I, I really believe he's doing the work against totalitarianism that the Jews are currently and have been doing for the last sixty years against Nazism. I really believe yeah, that. Yeah, and and and, 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 and P- Peterson, it's only one Peterson, man. Um, one of the things that affected him uh, very deeply because he believes he, he's deeply. Uh, so so I mean he he's a student of the. Uh, the, the the Old Testament and the uh, the New Testament. I, I I know that those are superficial phrases, but he uh, was very affected by uh, the, the the Holocaust. I mean, so he I mean, you know that that that's, that's that's very convenient these days because you become apologist of the Holocaust and then you somehow ingratiate yourself with academia or, 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 the, or the power structure but but he was he was he said that he, he he couldn't get over that and he couldn't figure out why the germans who he really loved you know all these, all these philosophers in his tradition could do something like that and so i i think he thought that what the germans did to the jews was was bad it was very bad and it made him sick and he actually i have no yeah. doubt i have i have no doubt i have no doubt but what's clear to me, though, is with this this recent intellectual confrontation between him and this other side, is that the the, the conflict of the 20th century is still playing out in a, in a, perhaps a slightly and, different form. And and, 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 and and it's because people are not really historically aware, right. and they also, more importantly, have no other alternative. They have no well, other alternative. I mean, and technology is just exacerbating and, 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 the situation. And the, and the, it's just and, and creating. The, the irony is that there is there is this um, there is this perception that that the the, the left wing is you know associated with 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 a lot of Jewish power, and that's 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 probably true. Um, but um, obviously, the Jews have done a, a good job of trying to like you know like not allow. It's World not, War, I mean, World War. it's true to a degree. Like it's true. It's it's true to a degree that the left wing and Marxism was 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 open to Judaism. You have that whole um, what the hell was that called? That uh, that move. Uh, I can't even remember. Uh, but but in, in any case, there were a lot of. I mean, there were a lot of Jews involved in Marxism and and in the roots of totalitarianism. Um, Jews were very involved in that. R- but right, right. Jews and, and, and were that, killed in pogroms, that, that, that pogroms has, that has a lot, that under has a lot Stalin with, at a great rate. But, but that has a lot to do with um, what you would expect. Totalitarianism and and, and left wing stuff was not a protection for right, Jews. Right, but 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 I, I would it was I would not say really. Just in, if if you look the Bloomberg if, if Bloomberg you look group, at, if you look Bloomsbury? if you look at race and Bloomberg? IQ, and I, I, I think know. this is this is this is. This is something that, that, that both Mano and Peterson have touched on. The average IQ of Ashkenazi Jews is like 105. Like 86 is the minimum you need to form a, a democracy. And the only people that have margin... <laughs> 86 is the minimum for a democracy? Is that yeah, what you said? Yeah, and if you look a map, if you if you look at a map of IQ... <laughs> is yeah, that right? That's right. <laughs> Wait, wait. So all the countries that don't have democracies are like, they're like below eighty six. Is that what the? Well, I mean, I mean, so I mean, you, you. I mean, this this IQ stuff is so ridiculous, right? I, I think it's all completely ridiculous. Jews Jews are off the charts. So are the Asians. No, so right? so the Koreans and the great. Japanese are are slightly higher than Ashkenazi Jews. But if you're talking about average, you know. A, I just don't think it means anything. I just don't. I just don't really think the IQ stuff really means well, a whole lot. It, it, it means that you're good. At, you're good at playing a certain game. You're really good I at this mean, game. That, that means and these people, what, for whatever what, reason, what, are what good you at this game. What you just said was very meaningful. I mean, I think that's exa- it, it, it means success in in in, in, a, in a certain rule based system, but which, a lot is, of, which is a game. But I mean, I mean, for people listening to this podcast, a lot of people think that IQ is a really determinative about like your value as a human being and historically and all that, and it's not. 
it really isn't. It just is a certain limited game at a certain time, and that's the one we're playing, which is the Western civilizational game, and IQ is the test. How well you But I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a more. value, though. Yeah, of course it's a value, but within its own, within a, within a certain game, within a, uh, that's all it is. I mean, and I'm not trying to dismiss it because this is a very dominant game. This game is becoming ever more dominant, but it comes at the exclusion of a lot of other games, a lot of other ways of looking at the world within which IQ, at least as is measured, those people who are testing very high would have very great difficulty functioning. It would probably be reduced to idiots. Yeah, but you know what? 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 what I I can't understand is why there is a contradiction between um, success in that system and, and and IQ and seeking happiness outside of a system that can't exist in the system of the high IQ people. Um, it, it feels like I've got a foot in one door, which is where I work hard. I pay my dues, I get good conscience in Western society, and I get money, and then I can go and have happiness in a, in a, in a system or society that can't even contemplate the rules that allow me to have my wealth. It just, it just seems very strange why, is it, why there's this contradiction where it's like I can go— Well, I think, we still, I think, I think we're still alive in a, in a time of, of great flux where— civilization has upgrown from agriculture and all these advances uh, in a certain way. I say advances. It's only, it's within a certain system is now being um, pushed technologically into all these other cultures. And it's a very rough sort of uh, understanding of these, of, of our way of life that these cultures wait, are wait, embracing. Just, 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 a, being just a pause real quick. Rapidly. We're going, we're at 155. Where do we get in the danger zone? Uh, let's cut okay. it at two hours. Let's cut it in okay. five minutes. But uh, yeah, so I I just I just think that there's 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 quite a bit of the the conflicts historically that have <clears throat> existed when cultures very different cultures who have been very isolated have confronted each other. I think that this time, the real conflict is the introduction of technology to cultures that kind of knew each other, but technology is exacerbating these differences. And so you have South Americans who have um, a very similar culture in many ways to Europe, but suddenly you give, you, you give them uh, technology and that exacerbates all of the differences. It, it, it doesn't heighten as so much the similarities. And so you see, I mean, just just take a look at like YouTube from South America um, and listen to the music that they listen to and the things they're talking about. It's they're using a Western, very very Western technology, but in a whole new way. So in many ways, they've become like different. They're they're going on a different trajectory, um, and they're they're exacerbating differences with the West instead of. Actually, feeling feeling closer to the West, which they might have right. felt before but the, the technology the, the was introduced. The excitement and the motivation of South America was the failed state, which even in Argentina today is still existing. And, I mean, Ar Argentina just interest uh, raised their in interest well, rates to thirty but, thirty. But yeah, but that's they're having hyperinflation, man. Yeah, that, but I mean that that is that is still beautiful failed stateness. Um, I think Argentina is actually doing better. The, high, the, the fact the interest rate is as high as it is is a sign of health. It was like when Volcker raised the interest rate yeah, in the United no, States. No, no point, point, point taken. But the, the point I was trying to make was that the failed state of Argentina was what made it beautiful. Right. But, but uh, I'm, 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 I'm sort of saying that there's all these sociological, technological things that are happening that are beyond the state, that the state can't stop that they have the internet, that they have YouTube, that they have all this new communication, which is instantaneous. Um, they can create these crowds out of nothing, even for fictitious reasons. This, this is a whole new dynamic, which is exacerbating tensions or ameliorating tensions. It is, it is creating differences between people that never had differences. Um, I mean, if Jordan Peterson... He must acknowledge that he could never have existed 
at the book, the book selling level that he's existing at, it were it not for the technologies of YouTube and the internet, this guy would be just a simple professor in right. Toronto. He would be a he would be a, a small time professor in Toronto with his family, and he'd build a couple of homes and know the Inuit the, or whatever the, he'd the, done. The, the that flip would be side all. Side of the coin that but he's yeah, but yeah. the outrage, but the outrage was created as a result of yeah, technology. But, so I would be, I would actually believe. I mean, McLohan, they're also from Toronto. Might I add, McLohan, the other great Canadian, would say that it's not about Jordan Peterson. It's about the technologies that have created Jordan Peterson. That is the content of Jordan Peterson's um, talks, yeah. really, is that Jordan Peterson is a creation of a well, technology I mean, that only is, is, is existing to reaffirm its own technology. Yeah. It's not about well, Jordan I mean, Peterson. So, so, I mean, he's been able to reach a lot of people um, based on the platform, but I think the platform that is hosting him probably wouldn't be a, be a big fan of what, he, what he's saying. But isn't isn't YouTube isn't YouTube very happy Jordan Peterson exists even if they do disagree with his politics, because YouTube is about creating YouTube, which is McLuhan's point, which is that Jordan Peterson is just content for a technology which reinforces itself. Right. So you you and value the content of you. Yeah. I mean, if that is the future, General, if that's the fu- if that's the future, the future is Facebook and YouTube. It has nothing to do with these petty arguments between leftists and rightists and fascists and totalitarians so, so, and Jordan so Peterson it, it, and his whole ideas it, it, of chaos and but, but, order. But somebody, it, but somebody it means nothing. Deft, He's just content. deft in the art of, of science and, and, and narrative and platform, and I think he understands all these things. I mean, I think he would say, you know, you, YouTube is, is, is there f- commensurate with the fall of the Jewish temple and the... And, and the um, no, he's a he's a professor, but, but, I think. But I mean, so the, I think the, the, the if metaphor. He can, I'm, if he can help one person, going for is if he can help the, one person, then the, it's the, fine. The, the Jewish people before their exodus had the uh, the temple. They had the priest who was a prophet, and that was their direct line for God. But once the temple and the living prophet were eliminated, they moved to the text, and so he is basically going in recognizing that the direct connection to God had been lost and he's inserted himself through oratory, i.e. text, in this common platform which is trying to be the new God. But by doing this, he is identifying the false idols and elevating not himself but the, the nature of his discourse as the idol that should be at least followed and so he's bringing back spirituality and a poetic narrative to a scientifically based culture but he's been luring people in through his scientific narrative and he's using a a platform which has annihilated a diversity of poetry and spirituality and he is in he's chuckling a lot of shit he's chuckling a lot of shit that sounds really hard to do I hope, uh, yeah. I, 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 look, I am absolutely certain he's a good man. I have no doubt he's a good man. Uh, but he's, he's juggling a lot of shit, and he's also using platforms which apparently are antagonistic but to him. I will tell you that your so, forklift video has gotten more views than some of his better lectures. Which... Uh, well, my forklift video has been up for a few years. His, his, no, I'm sure I mean, he's had some shit that should have gotten hits based on... It's been there for two years. And, uh, yeah. Really? So, I mean... My, for, my forklift video? Your forklift, forklift video, video is a half... A, a, I, I still can't... You've got a half a million. If you got a dollar, if you got a dollar for every click, you'd, have, you'd be a half a millionaire, man. Jesus fucking Christ. A half Goddamn a millionaire. Imagine that. But you know what? But you know what? I used a, um, I never monetized it because I used a, a song by a, a German kraut rock band. Hey, General, we're, we're, and, uh, we're at two I hours. I love that. Uh, we're at two hours. Well, let's, um, let's, let's cut it. Let's, let's just shut it down yeah. then in, uh, in yep. five seconds. So uh, five, 